blogging. Um, so today uh, we're talking about three-dimensional materials. Um, so as, as again, I, I'm your host, David Shea. I've been a cataloger for 11 years now, um, doing everything from public libraries to government libraries to academic libraries. And, um, I'm excited to be here again with uh, everyone here at South Carolina State Library. And I'm Katie Hoskins, um, and I've been working for David in the Urban Department for two years now. Um, and this is my first time co-hosting this session uh, that David does every year. But uh, if you've been with us for, <laughs> for these previous uh, sessions this week and last week, thanks for joining us for the last time. Um, I guess I will take see. it away. Yeah. So there's some slides about us. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and stop my video, and then I will just uh, continue on with the with the PowerPoint. Okay. So, oh, let me see here. So basically, what we're going to do is the same um, kind of concept that we we did yesterday. I'm going to go over some general things that we wanna keep in mind when working with 3D objects. And then David will take us um, in more detail through um, our MARC fields. Um, so starting off, what I want to talk about is what we can use to supplement RDA for 3D objects. Um, so, I mean, as you know, RDA guidelines can be used for cataloging a whole lot more than, than language material, um, but it does sort of lean that way, um, sort of toward language material. Um, and catalogers working with objects um, that are really far from what we might think of as um, typical resources held by libraries. Um, these catalogers working with special formats will find RDA really too general, um, too general to fully describe these objects that don't fit so neatly into RDA's entities and guidelines for specific elements. Um, but, you know, as we know, libraries do have many non-print resources um, and realia and other uh, objects that we need to describe. So, of course, it would be kind of impossible <laughs> Uh, for RDA to include specific um, and practical and complete cataloging rules for every single type of resource. So general guidelines is what we get. And um, really that was the whole plan for RDA. Um, in Maxwell's handbook for RDA, it's interesting, he points to um, the archive site for the, uh, the Joint Steering Committee when it was going by that name, um, about discussions about all of the different uh, specialist cataloging manuals that can supplement RDA. And there are so many of them um, that have come and gone um, in and out of existence, you know, over time. Um, and really it's, it's these specialized uh, communities, these specialized guidelines, um, the people who work with certain types of materials that become responsible uh, for supplementing the guidance provided in RDA. Um, and actually, we've already seen this <laughs> in, our, in our previous sessions. Um, so when we talked about um, looking outside of RDA, um, when we're going from holding an item in our hand to having it uh, fully described in a MARC bib record. So we saw this for cataloging documents for video and audio recordings um, with the Music Library Association with MLA's best practices. Um, and we see it with serials, uh, with cartographic materials, rare books and manuscripts, uh, children's literature. All of these can be you know, um, described with the, the guidelines in RDA, but we also have specialist um, guidelines for them as well. And certainly <laughs> there are best practices for documenting um, 3D objects. And the main one that we're going to 
to talk about, and a really good one, is OLAC's uh, best practices for cataloging objects using RDA and MARC 21. Okay, so this is linked um, here on the slide. Um, it's, it's available for free on um, OLAC's site um, as a PDF, but unlike um, the PCC and LC or Library of Congress uh, PCC policy statements for RDA, it's not integrated um, into the toolkit, um, but it is available in the PDF form online at that link. Um, so this was just recently, you know, updated in January of 2020, and OLAC, of course, stands for Online Audiovisual Catalogers, but they they deal with a lot of different types of material besides AV AV ones. Okay, so next we're going to talk about what qualifies um, as a 3D object, what we're even talking about, what it is. Um, we know that we have so many different types of, uh, of visual materials, but 3D or uh, you know, 3D materials are just one subset of those visual materials. Um, okay, so in RDA, we have some occasional guidelines that apply to what are called three-dimensional forms. And this is defined, um, it's here on the slide, um, in the RDA glossary as a content type consisting of content expressed through a form or forms intended to be, be perceived visually in three dimensions. Um, and then we have these examples. So sculptures, models, naturally occurring objects and specimens, holograms, etc. cetera. Um, and so we certainly want to pay attention to these instructions whenever three-dimensional forms are mentioned specifically. Um, these come up with things like, um, with things like recording the extent, the dimensions, the scale of the object, uh, things like that. Um, so like in the, the guidelines for extent, there's a section specifically for three-dimensional forms um, with all sorts of fun examples like um, two feather hair bands is one of them. Okay, now there are multiple RDA terms for content type that include the words three-dimensional, um, but don't let this throw you off. <laughs> You can see that in, in this table on the left here. Um, and this table actually is adapted from one provided by Library of Congress in the term and code list for RDA content types. So it's linked here at the bottom of the slide. Um, on the left in the column for terms for content type, the RDA element content type, um, we have cartographic, three-dimensional form, uh, cartographic tactile three-dimensional form, three-dimensional moving image, three-dimensional form, and tactile three-dimensional form. Uh, and I've included some others as well, like still image um, text, just to kind of jog our memory on what exactly a content type can include. So we record one or more of these in uh, field 336 in the MARC record. Okay, but the, the idea of content type also shows up in the fixed field um, for type of record, or well, in the leader in the, the sixth position. Um, so that is for type of record. Um, even though it's part of the leader and not the main body of the record that our users um, will see. Um, the code here does matter because um, in the MARC environment, it really, um, it shapes the way that we think about describing a resource um, and what fields are even appropriate to include in that type of record. So the codes for type of record that can correspond to, or that do correspond to the RDA content type um, are on the right. 
um, in the, this table. Um, okay, so keep in mind that these two columns, though, are, are not perfectly equivalent um, as to what they describe. And uh, when we have a resource that combines any number of content types, we have to decide what the primary type is. Um, so these two here, uh, cartographic three-dimensional form uh, and cartographic tactile three-dimensional form. Um, so these are both treated as cartographic materials in a mark. Um, three-dimensional moving image, even though it's intended to be perceived in three dimensions, uh, we describe it primarily in Mark as a moving image. So what I think really helps us narrow down the scope of 3D object um, is in the Mark format, what is called the type of record, what we have on the right. Um, so what I mean when I say that these two columns aren't perfectly equivalent um, is that they kind of describe not exactly the same thing. So mark type of record defines, um, and this is straight out of the OCLC bib format site. So mark type of record defines the characteristics and components of the record. Um, we use it to differentiate differentiate records created for various types of content and material. So it's a, it's a little bit more than um, just the contents of, of our resource. Um, and of course, to determine the appropriateness and validity of certain elements, uh, data elements in the record is part of that definition. Um, you can see pretty clearly also in the chart that, um, that some of the mark types of record are broader and some are more specific um, than the RDA content types. Um, so now, mark visual materials. Um, these codes that show up over here on that table, um, these fall into four types. And they're represented by the codes G, K, R, and O, that's projective medium, two-dimensional non-projected graphic, three-dimensional artifact or naturally occurring object, and kit. Um, so 3D artifacts and naturally occurring objects are coded R, and that is what we're focusing on when we talk about guidelines for 3D objects. Um, now this is the same for OLAX best practices for objects. It's, it's that group that falls under the type of record R for a three-dimensional artifact or naturally occurring object. And for content type, that kind of, kind of equates to um, what in RDA is called three-dimensional form or tactile three-dimensional forms as well. Um, kit down here, which is uh, the code O um, is not addressed in the OLAC best practices, um, even though they can contain 3D objects and often do. Um, so we also won't really make a point of addressing kids specifically in this session. So the next thing that I want to kind of address is the source of information. I know there's a lot on this slide, um, but RDA gives us some general and also some more specific guidelines for identifying the preferred source of information when we're identifying and describing uh, manifestations. All right, so <laughs> this is going to be a little bit heavy, um, maybe a bit tense, but I really wanted to include it uh, because it's really, just a fundamental part of starting on a description. Um, and at least for me, when I'm in the toolkit, I'm, I'm usually looking up something like super specific um, about a, a particular element. Um, and I think these, these guidelines for sources of information are maybe not visited super often when you've been cataloging for a while. So at the very least, you know, maybe it will be 
a good reminder if you are already familiar with all of this. And um, just stick with me here. <laughs> okay, so the source of the description for three objects is actually especially important because you, you may have a lot of different uh, pieces and parts that make up a single resource. Uh, you can potentially have identifying information on any of these, any of these pieces and parts, um, or none of them <laughs> at all could have identifying information. Um, a really good example of this is a board game. Um, they come with just so many different uh, pieces, way more than you could really even keep up with unless you like left it uh, sealed, unopened, unplayed, all of that. <laughs> um, you might have a hard time cataloging it though. <laughs> um, so anyway, all of these pieces can be in different formats too. And so with a board game, we have like the, the actual playing board, uh, maybe some cards, player pieces that you move around the board, um, tokens, dice, instruction booklets we usually have, spinners, uh, maybe even like a CD or something. So we definitely want to describe all of these, these little pieces and parts as just that, parts of the board game, the resource as a whole. And so we would want to follow the guidelines in RDA for creating a comprehensive uh, description in this case. All right. so. If we do choose to create a comprehensive description, in RDA, we can treat uh, accompanying material as part of the manifestation. Um, so this is important for determining uh, the, the preferred source of information within the resource. And so RDA tells us this, uh, when describing the manifestation as a whole, using a comprehensive description, treat accompanying material as part of the manifestation itself. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, an accompanying booklet for whatever information we need before looking to a source outside of the manifestation uh, altogether. Um, and for containers, we can, can treat uh, a container as part of the manifestation as well. Um, but we do need to remember that uh, this applies only to containers issued with the resource. Um, so the, the statement here, and I apologize, my mouse keeps falling asleep, so I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen or not. Um, but anyway, the statement here is treat a container issued with the manifestation. Um, for example, a box in which a game or kit is issued as part of the manifestation itself. Treat a container that is not issued with the manifestation, like a box or case made by the owner, as a source uh, outside the manifestation itself. So these two statements um, are general and they do apply to any resource. Um, but we do have some more specific guidelines though. Um, and 3D objects fall under uh, other manifestations, that section in RDA. Um, and under that, tangible manifestations. Um, okay, so one of these more specific guidelines for materials um, that, that don't consist of pages or leaves or moving images is that we should make a note on the source of the title proper. Um, in just a moment, you'll see that uh, OLAC's best practices are very much in agreement with this. Um, but for those other manifestations that are tangible, so not online resources, um, our, prefer our preferred source of information will be uh, the first of any of these three sources, ABC, that has a title. We want to take a title from the source um, and other information from that same source as the title. Okay, so um, if it's there. 
Um, and that, of course, is what we mean by preferred. So our first choice is a label on the actual item itself. Um, then we can look to things like the container and accompanying materials, and then to anywhere else um, on the manifestation where the information is presented formally. Um, now, if there is absolutely no identifying information that we need that's on the manifestation itself, um, and that's including the container and the accompanying material, then we look to sources outside of the manifestation. So <laughs> this might be like when you're hoping and praying that you can find something, anything about um, this random you know, item by maybe searching online. Um, when we take information from an outside source for elements that require transcription, um, and this is when we say we're supplying the information, not transcribing it. RDA says we need to specify this by providing a note uh, or by using square brackets. Um, and then the exception at the bottom here um, can apply to uh, certain 3D objects. So do not indicate that the information was taken from a source outside the manifestation itself if the manifestation is of a type that does not normally carry identifying information. So photograph, naturally occurring object, a collection, and of course, a naturally occurring object, that's one that falls under our category of 3D. Um, and of course, yeah, these wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't normally come with a label. Um, okay, so again, these guidelines are not specific to to 3D objects only, but they will come up often with 3D objects. Um, now, what is specific to 3D objects though is the interpretation of all of this. So the decisions that OLAC has made um, about the source of information. And that is, that is on this slide, next slide. All right, so the first one, uh, that I've included here says, always make a note on the source of title. And I mean, this really does make sense when you're dealing with something that can describe itself in, in <laughs> 50 different ways or, or not at all. Um, there's a higher chance that you or I or a, another cataloger um, make him up with a different title um, from the same resource when it's given in just so many different forms um, on the resource itself and the container and the accompanying material, um, which of course we consider part of the manifestation. Um, so we always want to include a note on where the title is coming from, even if it's considered a preferred source. Okay, so also regarding title, the, the best practice um, listed second here on the slide um, is that we dispense with square brackets for supplied titles for objects. Um, so it seems kind of like we're, we are to take the approach that with 3D objects, um, there's a lot less normal than there is kind of abnormal for these things um, in regards to manifestations that would normally um, carry identifying information. Um, which is from the, the exception that we saw on the last slide. Um, so again, dispense with square brackets for supplied titles for objects. The third recommendation here is uh, use either notes or brackets for other supplied elements according to appropriateness and catalogers judgment. Um, so this would be something like a publisher's name that you found online because it wasn't anywhere on the resource. You would supply the publisher's name um, either in brackets or indicate that it's from a source um, outside the manifestation by including a note um, stating that. Um, and of course you could add a note um, anyway um, if something still needs clarification, um, especially if it's you know, clarification that would be helpful for identifying that resource. All right, so to kind of recap those three uh, recommendations, supply titles get a note um, on the source, 
and no brackets. Okay, so the other elements get either of these. So either a note on the source or brackets. Um, but from like from a lot of the records that I've looked at, I think using brackets is probably still pretty common. Um, the most common method for other elements when they're being supplied. Um, but if you've seen otherwise, David or anyone else, um, please you know jump in, say so. <laughs> but honestly, for myself anyway, um, and I think probably other people can relate to this too. It would feel almost wrong <laughs> to supply something and not include it in brackets. Okay, so <laughs> as you know, there are many other guidelines provided in RDA besides the ones that we <laughs> that we just talked about for um, for recording source of information. Um, we talked about comprehensive descriptions only, but in the OLAC best practices for objects, um, it does a really good job of addressing all of the relevant uh, RDA guidelines for many additional situations that you might encounter. So of course, things like um, if you're creating an analytical description for a single part of a multi-part three-dimensional object, or um, if you have a multi-part 3D object with or without collective and individual titles. So all of these guidelines we see in RDA are followed up with um, best practices from OLAC um, with you know, practical ways to apply them and, and plenty of examples. All right, so there are just a couple other things um, that I think are worth mentioning before, before we start talking about the more nitty gritty um, instructions for each of the MARC fields. So the best practices document really makes a point of highlighting the RDA statement um, on conformance. Um, and this is conformance to RDA and its, its uh, core element. Um, I don't actually have that statement on the slide, but um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, since OLAC does make a point of, of highlighting it specifically. So this is what it says. As a minimum, a resource description for a work expression manifestation or item should include all the core elements that are readily, or excuse me, applicable and readily ascertainable. Um, the description should also include any additional elements that are required in a particular case to differentiate the resource from one or more other resources with similar identifying information. Um, now, the, the best practices document, it really does sort of take this to heart, I think is a good way um, to describe it. Um, the recommendations are based on that idea for that for 3D objects. Um, many times the RDA elements and even the core elements are not applicable and readily ascertainable. Um, we don't want to force a record for a 3D object to look exactly like a record for you know, a print book. So the best practice recommendations are provide only elements that are applicable and readily ascertainable and record information from the resource in the element or elements uh, it most logically corresponds to. Uh, this is especially true for uh, the recommendations on RDA's elements for uh, production, publication, distribution, manufacture, and copyright. Um, these are obviously going to be hard to record for a naturally occurring object, uh, like a geode or some plant seeds, something like that. Uh, but even for published items, things that are publicly available, um, like clothing or food utensils or a typewriter or whatever, these things aren't going to have the traditional uh, publication statements that we're used to. Um, so what we want to do is record everything that is ascertainable uh, from the object, and then also record anything that we can find from outside the object. Um, but if we can't find any information for a particular element, we, we just won't record anything at all. Um, so you don't 
need to include that um, in brackets, you know, blah, 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 element not identified, like publisher not identified in brackets. If there is no applicable or uh, readily ascertainable information. So RDA specifies that we should include that statement, but the best practices for objects says that we do not have to. Okay, so this example record, um, I just want to quickly look at before I hand it over to David, uh, is for um, a, a puzzle, a game that I cataloged a, a while ago that came with some other, um, some other games, uh, board games and things like that and other puzzles um, from a particular collector. But this one in particular was, was um, really lacking in, in information that I, that I thought I would really need, um, that I would need. So, okay, <laughs> get my mouse back here. Um, you see for the, the title proper here in the 245, I have picture blocks depicting children and farm animals. This is a devised title, um, but it's not, it's not in brackets. I do include a 588 no, note though for title devised by cataloger. Um, this, this puzzle was really interesting because it came in a box and absolutely nowhere on this box, anywhere on this thing, um, did it have any information, any text. Um, the only things I, I knew that I could go off of were the, the things that the cataloger, or excuse me, the collector, um, thought he knew or knew about this item. And that was that it was published in Germany sometime in the um, 1880s. So <laughs> that, that is what I had to go on. Um, I included it in, in brackets here to show that this is not something that was on the resource itself. It's supplied um, from outside the resource. And I actually have a question mark here for 1880 because I think that's the year, but you know, it could, it could be something else. <laughs> All right. So that is what I have for you today. And now I'm going to turn it over to David and he will, he will guide you through some of these more specific uh, mark, mark fields um, with your instructions for um, mark encoding, but combining that with RDA and the OLAC best practices for objects. Okay, so. If you're ready, David, I will go ahead yeah. and stop sharing. Okay. Great. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's take a look at. Let me get back to where I should be. Um, so, great. Um, so, just before we get started, I've added. Oh, I David. Some, yes. It's in that that note uh, view again. Oh, crud. The so, presenter view. Yeah. Again. How about that? OK, yeah, that's perfect. OK, yeah, it's just switching which screen I'm using, I guess. Um, so I just got some quick resources and links about, you know, for useful things for working on Mark um, and RDA records. Um, well, let's take a couple we'll look, example, we'll look at a couple example records. So the main thing that I'm focused on for my part of this presentation is equipment and board games because these just because these are two common kinds of um, things that a, that a library might have to check out that, that qualifies under these um, as three in three dimensional form. So the first one we have um, a 3D printer. This is a catalog record for a 3D printer. Um, and then this slide and the following slide are for the board game Scythe, um, which I have, but I've only been ever able to play like once or twice, unfortunately. Um, it's just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that you can find um, in this um, record, uh, what kinds of things are important in this record. Um, so let's take a look at 
our fixed field. So our top line fixed field here is our um, our object, our uh, equipment um, line. The second line is for um, board games. So they're both their type is R for Realia. You're, this is the type you're going to use for any kind of game, device, models, sculptures, a rock, anything like that that you might want to catalog. Um, so you can see they're both R. So um, one thing I will other mention, so if you have a naturally occurring object um, that has, or, or any kind of object actually that has no linguistic content at all, um, there's no language component um, in the language entry, you can, type, you can enter ZXX for no linguistic material. Um, another area of special interest you might want to pay attention to here is your audience, um, especially with board games that frequently have uh, uh, an age range listed on for you know suggested age range of players. Um, so you might want to take, pay special attention to that. Um, and our, our the third line, um, this team at is another one that's a major one that's going to describe what kind of object you have. Um, this is actually, this is position 33 in a subfield eight. R, just like R here, um, it's used for any naturally occurring object or man-made object that doesn't have another kind of classification. So statues, machines, musical instruments, um, equipment of any kind, as well as naturally occurring objects like fossils and minerals. Um, here in the second one, I have G for board games, um, W for toys is another one. Um, if you had a children's section in your library, you had a bunch of stuffed animals that you wanted to catalog, you could enter W for toys. Um, another thing I'm going to mention, especially in conjunction with um, naturally occurring objects, is that you have an option for DTST and dates um, to enter N in the DTST. The letter N is for um, something when, when there is no date that is, you know, it is not possible to determine a date for this object. So like if you had a chunk of crystal or something that you wanted to catalog or um, that sort of thing, you would enter N and then both dates would simply be quadruple U. Um, stepping into the actual record, title and statement of responsibility, Katie went over it really well. She's talking about your, you wanna, containers are acceptable, are your acceptable source of titles and statements of responsibility um, for things like board games or equipment. Um, here we have 500 note title and statement of responsibility from container. Um, and I mentioned, because so 500 is an acceptable way, acceptable way to put this in. Uh, SK mentioned the OLAC best practice is 588, um, but both are valid, acceptable um, ways to enter uh, title and statement responsibility. Uh, 264 production, publication, manufacturer, and distribution. Um, you're going to record this just like you would for any other kind of published material. Again, um, putting things in square brackets when you have to draw it from outside the source, um, entering things as they can be, um, but again, not entering, but not entering materials when it is impossible to enter something um, for like a physical object. Um, you may not, there's not really going to be just like a, for say like a crystal or a rock or a naturally occurring object, obviously there's not going to be a place of publication or place of production or a publisher or a year. Um, physical description. Um, so this is where things can get really interesting with, um, with three-dimensional objects. Um, in your subfield A, you're recording the number of objects that make up, the number of things making up the object um, with subunits in parentheses. So we have one printer, one game, and in parentheses, we have many, many, many things. Um, let's actually go back to um, this 300 statement for Scythe. 
two rule books, one quick reference guide, five dual layer player mats, one game board, 80 resource tokens, 80 coins, and so on and so forth. Um, there are a vast number of things that um, enter here and you can break that down in as much detail as you want. So, um, or really as, or, or you may want to narrow it down a little bit if, if you feel that's more appropriate. Part of this um, is so you can keep track of what should actually be in this um, game or in this kit or in, um, in this collection of things. Um, in your subfield B, um, where books you may, you know, you describe illustrations and maps and things. This is your recording your materials and color. So the site, the board game has cardboard, paper, wood, plastic, and there are colors to it. And it is in box. Um, this, so for things like board games, you can record the dimensions of the carrier, um, what kind of box or other container it might be in. So this box is 30 centimeters by 36 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Um, and then you can always add your plus sign E to add related materials that are not considered integral to the object. So in our board game, we've got all of these things in our subfield A because they are integral to the board game. They, that's literally what makes the board game. Up here with the printer, the, the object itself is the printer all of these things that we've listed in this plus size, plus sign E related materials, these, these are all things that are external to the actual printer, um, but that go, that, that, that are related to it. So the power cord, a USB cable, a micro SD card, these are things that you can just go to the store, to a store or online to Amazon and replace. You cannot necessarily replace um, all of the individual pieces out of this game or the individual pieces of the actual physical printer itself. Um, here are some basic three, three X fields. Um, on the left here, we have um, the printer. It's a three, three dimensional form. It's unmediated. You don't need, you know, you're just using the printer or other, some other kind of piece of equipment and it's an object. Um, the board game is counts as other does not, um, um, yeah, equipment classes, equipment classes as an object, board games and kits classes other. And again, these 336 and 338 fields and the 337 field, they're repeatable. So that you, so that if you need to, if you feel like part, different parts of, um, of the object or uh, if different parts of the object make up equal parts of the whole, um, you can repeat additional 33x fields. Uh, your 340 physical medium. Um, this is, is another another way to describe what it is you have. Um, here, are, this is for the board game. So we've got cardboard, paper, wood, and plastic, each in separate subfield A's. We've got a subfield B describing the size of the box, and a subfield two for terminology, if it has controlled terminology. Things like this are really useful for art. Um, you'd have subfield A, canvas, subfield A, acrylic paint, or um, subfield, you have, a, you have a statue, you have subfield A, granite, or subfield A, bronze, or something like that. Um, some of these things will have RDA controlled terminology, some of them will not. Um, the RDA registry.info right here is your good source of um, is there a controlled terminology or is there a control um, for any specific part of this, of what you're looking at? Um, they have some really good lists. Form of work, um, no indicators. Um, you can use this to differentiate from different works, uh, like a, to differentiate a book from a movie that's based on or to classify a genre. Here we've got uh, board games and that's a Library of Congress subject heading. Um, LCGFT, the Library of Congress genre form terms are also a good source. 
um, for this sort for some for a uh, 380 entry. Now your 5xx note fields. Um, there are a lot of note fields that you could potentially include. Um, for board games, you might want to consider things like the number of players or the playtime of the game. Um, you can you can have your 500 or your 588 to um, attribute your your statement, or you can um, to, for attribution for where your um, title and statement of responsibility come from. You can include any. Um, related notes about production. You can provide further classification, further clarification on the contents or what an object is in your 500 note, an individual 500 notes or a single 520 note. Um, and you can also list other requirements that something might have, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Some, some other minor ones, uh, 507 scale note for things like models and dioramas, so life size or, 1 16th scale, 1 to 16, 1 to 8. Um, and you, have, you can have your 521 field, just like you would have for a movie. You can use 521 to list the uh, age, in, age recommendations for a board game. Um, and you can also include 586 award notes. Um, they may be useful for, um, since there's been a big, you know, in the last decade or so, the big upswing in interest in board games has um, brought awards to that. Um, lots of other interesting things. Um, again, a 500 general note is always useful for describing pretty much anything you feel you need to get across about something, but don't necessarily have another field that you can use. Um, 538, system details note. Um, no, you know, indicators. This is your plain text field for technical information. Um, so this is from the uh, from the 3D printer. It's compatible with this this soft with these oops with these softwares. It's compatible with these computers. It does require an SD card to store things on. Um, you might want to include um, any kind of other um, medium device, media device that might be used to interpret something on this, or if there's um, if there's any kind of software or hardware that your equipment needs um, to be used, any additional kinds of supplies you might want, um, you can have that in a 538 note. Um, 588 sort description source of description notes. Um, this, like Katie mentioned, is um, the recommended way to per, to um, to source your title. Here we've got for here we've got here we've got the example title title from manufacturer's website. Um, 7xx fields um, added authors, um, just like books and other kinds of media. Um, there can be multiple people involved in producing this game, producing something. So again, this is the seven XX fields for scythe. Um, mm -hmm. This gentleman right here is a designer. He's an illustrator. In fact, um, this board game is actually based, scythe is actually based around this gentleman's original art. Um, and he illustrates a lot of the, all the cards and things in the book. Um, there's another designer, designer. Here we have this person entered as a consultant. Um, let's step back to the example record. Um, uh, here in a 508, here we have our 508 field. Um, produce people who are involved in production. This person here is um, who's in, I've entered him down here as a consultant. It lists him as special advisor. Uh, there's nothing, you know, that can mean a lot of things, but I, but looking at the um, relationship designators list, um, which I think, yeah, really here, um, consultant seemed the most applicable to um, this person. Um, like I said, yeah, not all relevant ter 
relator terms may re relevant or fit the roles of the people involved. You can create your own relator terms if you feel that they are necessary. But the key thing here is to decide as an institution, not as an individual, rather than as an individual, what you feel those additional relators should be and to always be consistent. Like think of together as a group, think of what's going to help your patrons find this, find this or understand what this person does and always be consistent as you apply them. Um, so another useful field um, that we have that is available for any kind of record, but that may be specifically useful for equipment and games is a 586 electronic location and access. So this is the way you're gonna link in your bib record to outside resources. Um, we've got 586, it's a website. Um, there are several different options for one, but this is for a second indicator, but this is the most common. And in our subfield U, we have our URL. Um, in this case, it's the manual for the printer guide for the printer. Um, and then we have our subfield Z description of the link. And this is what should show up to your users in your online catalog. Um, it'll be a hype, it should just be a hyperlink with this phrase. Um, you can link to manuals for equipment or for games. A lot of board game companies like to have links on YouTube and stuff on how to play their game or on their websites um, that give tutorials. Um, we don't use um, a lot of 856s here at Rare Books or in Thomas, the main line or Thomas Cooper um, because of things like link rot. So be aware that when you're creating a 586, link rot is a thing. I think the half-life of a link has been studied to be 138 weeks. So uh, every 138 weeks, the likeliness that a link will work will decrease by half. So after 130, first 138 weeks, there's only a 50% chance that a link will still work. Um, so just under three years after an additional uh, 138 weeks, it's something like 25% um, likelihood that it's still that, that a link still works. And this is because of migrating servers, um, changes in who's providing your internet. Are you moving from Amazon Web Services to some other um, hosting company, changes in address, changes in the, the file structure of a website? Um, there are many, many ways that a link can break. Um, so it is very important that you consider that when you're Letting, when you're having one of these um, in your record. Um, and that is what we have have a bit planned for you guys today. Um, are there any questions, anything, anything people are curious about? Um, any kind, do you have any kind of um, 3D object that you guys uh, catalog on a regular basis or that your library collects? Um, I'd love to know. I've, I've done a few sculptures over the last few years. Um, definitely the first one of the first few months I was here, I had to catalog like a foot tall sculpture of a rooster. And I'm like, mm, what do I do here? But yeah. Um, if not, um, then uh, Oh, great. Um, yeah, no, board. I'll, I feel like there's a lot of libraries out there that are starting board game collections. Um, uh, yeah, sewing, machi mach sewing machines, yeah. Um, there's always the, the tale, I forget which what library it is, there's always the story about there's a library out there that has a collection of cake pans that they lend out to people. Um, so if you want a cake that looks like uh, you know, Mickey Mouse head, you can, they have a cake pan for it that you can borrow and that sort of thing. Um, we have board games here. We have, um, uh, we have a lot of 19th century board games, which are always kind of interesting. And we've um, gotten some other board games that uh, um, we look forward to that uh, we're going to do at some points and um, things like that. I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I have any sitting around my office but no um 
but yeah. If Kay, do you have anything else to add that you think is important or? Uh, no, I don't have anything else okay. that I that I was planning to go over. Okay, good. Um, if that's it, um, we just want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, for, for those of us who have been, for those of you who have been here all four days, uh, listen to us talk. Um, you know, thanks. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come out and help, you know, other catalogers in the library community. Um, you know, yes, definitely. we're anytime reach out to us and say, hey, you know, what's your thought on this? And, or what's your thought on that? And, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just great to be helping out. Yes, I, I do this to David all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. That's, that's, that is one of the reasons Katie is here since she was an intern. It's like Katie asks good, Katie asks good questions. So, um, and yes, uh, Tiffany, you're going to be sending on the PowerPoints to everybody, right? Yes, PowerPoints and recordings. I'm going to mm -hmm. stop the recording here.